All right, join me, if you would, in your Bibles in Isaiah. This morning, we're going to consider a simple question. Are you trusting God in the circumstances of your life? Are you trusting God in the nitty-gritty details and circumstances of your life now? Oh, week after Easter, we've already sung this morning. We remember every Sunday, Jesus is alive. He's a risen, living Savior. We say, yes, we agree. Therefore, we trust him. I like to think there is sometimes a difference between what the right answer is or what the official position is and what we tend to practice. So, is Jesus alive? Yes. Do I trust him? Yes. Am I going to heaven because Jesus took the penalty for my sin and I believe it. Well, if that's true of you, you say yes. So do I trust God? Yep. Yes, 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 and yes. On all the biggest stuff, I trust God. Um, How are you doing trusting God with the difficulty you're experiencing in your marriage? Are you trusting God with the job that you have that you don't really care for? Are you trusting God trying to parent your kids through a long phase that is discouraging? Are you trusting God with your failing health? Are you trusting God as you try to care for a loved one whose health is failing? Are you trusting God in the relationships that you're trying to love people towards Christ? Are you trusting him in the little things? Because I I think our official position is, yes, we trust God for the biggest things. He is my answer for sin and death and eternal life. Yes, I trust him. But then when it comes to dealing with a coworker that's cranky at work on Monday, we can pretty easily start to trust ourselves, come up with our own plan, our own way to solve a problem. But we trust God, right? That's our official position. Do you trust him in the particulars of your life, your marriage, your parenting, your finances, your relationships, in addressing your character defects, your wants, your desires, do you trust him? We're going to see in the book of Isaiah as he tells us a bit of history that leads into a prophecy for all of God's people, that affects us even to this day, we're going to look at a snippet in the life of a man named Ahaz. I'm going to show you a picture here to help you understand the passage we're going to read before we read it. Because if we just jump straight into it, you're going to be like, I don't have any idea what this is saying. I've studied this for hours this week to just get a handle on it. Um, This is most of the information you need in one infographic so that the uh, it will make sense when we read the story. Here's the skinny of it. The countries in white, you can read. Our story centers around the king of Judah in the south. His name is Ahaz. So next to each country, I put the name of the king that gets referenced, the capital city that gets referenced. You'll need to know that um, Israel at this time in history, we're reading in Isaiah, they're now separated from the southern kingdom. So Judah, the story centers there with the king Ahaz. He is being attacked by his enemy to the north. They used to be his countrymen. Now they are his enemies. So Israel, often called Ephraim, is currently led by King Pekah. But he's referred to in the story as the son of Remaliah. And for those of you who, when you read these words, you're like, how do you pronounce these words? Don't even worry about it because it doesn't actually matter because this part of the Bible is written in Hebrew. You don't speak Hebrew, so you, no matter how you pronounce the words, it doesn't sound like it did at the time. Don't worry about it. As long as you can keep it straight, you're good. So the king of Israel, Pekah, is now formed an alliance with the king of Syria. That's another enemy. Rezin, reason, pronounce it however you want. Those two enemies of Judah have formed an alliance together. They're all most afraid of the empire further to the east, Assyria, that at this point in history is becoming the first superpower in the world. This is 735 years before Jesus. 
These are the characters involved in the story. You can see a timeline in the upper left of what actually ends up happening. In the lower right are names of three children that are mentioned in the story. The significance of the name is not how you pronounce it, it's what the name means. So this infographic is your handy reference guide. What we're gonna read, you need to understand, Syria and Israel have formed an alliance against Judah. They want Judah to be their friend and join them in a super alliance against Assyria. That's their master plan. Except for Judah says, no, thank you. Judah resists. So Syria and Israel say, plan B. We're just going to steal everything that you have. And we're going to dethrone your king and we'll put a puppet king over you. And then you can be on our team. You can come willingly or by force. King Ahaz is saying, no, I am not going to join your alliance. So now he has war from Israel and Syria. Ahaz makes a really dumb choice. It's understandable, but it is in the final analysis dumb. Instead of trusting in God, he trusts in himself, and he has a brilliant idea. Ooh, what if I pay the king of Assyria a whole lot of money to come and save my bacon? That's exactly what he does. Though God tells him, don't be afraid of Israel and Syria. They're like cigarette butts. They're not going to burn much longer. Just don't worry about them. Trust me. He says, no, I'm going to go get help from Assyria. So Isaiah says to him, okay, if you're not going to trust me, I will leave you to your own device. So what happens in history, Isaiah, what he spoke comes to pass. The Assyrians gobble up Syria gobble up Israel, and then in the future will ransack much of Judah. That's what we're going to read this morning. This is in Isaiah chapter 7. And the question that you want to have in mind is not, should Ahaz have trusted God? Yes. Did Ahaz trust God? No. Are we supposed to trust God? Yes. You need to be asking yourself, do you, in the particulars of your life, right now, this week, this coming month, your kids, your school, your relationships, your hopes, your character, do you trust God? He's going to give you much evidence that you can trust Him. He delights in proving His faithfulness, but if you don't have faith in him, you won't see his faithfulness as faithfulness. All right, let's take it up together. We'll begin at the beginning of chapter 7. This is the word of the Lord. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up against Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. They have a good reason, a good visceral reason, a fear that tells them, I don't know if we can trust God. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear, Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within sixty-five years Ephraim will be shattered from being a people." And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz, 
Ask a sign of Yahweh your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put Yahweh to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Yahweh will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria." In that day, Yahweh will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds, for everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. Then Yahweh said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters, belonging to Maher Shalal Hashbaz, and I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, And she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to cry, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Yahweh spoke to me again. Because this people, the nation of Israel, has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck and its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel." This is the word of the Lord. Do you trust God in your circumstances and in your situation? Ahaz obviously does not. He and the heart of his people, when they heard of the alliance of their two enemies from the north in the shadow of Assyria, exerting its influence in their part of the world. It says that their heart trembled like a leaf. Chapter 4, shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. It is rarely when everything is going as it should in life that we experience the necessity of faith or see clearly the faithfulness of God. Ahaz, with good reason, is afraid. His people are afraid. Ahaz's life is told in the history books of the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 16, if you want to look at this later, 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28, they tell you about Ahaz. He's experienced defeat in battle, even significantly so, from Israel. God was gracious to him, And isn't this often what seems to happen in the people of Israel and in our lives today as Christians? We have a tendency to trust God. He disciplines us, appropriately so, and then he reminds us of his grace, and then we have another opportunity to trust him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But faith 
requires us to be vulnerable. That's a word that people use much today to talk about interpersonal relationships. When you trust God, He often puts you in a place where you have to wait upon Him. Right? Isn't this how it normally happens in life? As fallen human beings, we are always looking for the path of least resistance. Has any parent ever taught their child, look for the easy way? When you find the easy way, take it. What parent says to their kid, look for maximum short-term gain and minimum pain? That's just baked in. Every human being is masterful at that. Somehow, no parent has ever taught a child that, and then yet for every generation, somehow, we're masterful at that. Maximum short-term reward, minimum pain. But candidly, doesn't the road of faith often in the short term cause us to experience duress or pain or waiting or uncertainty? And often the promise of the reward is in the future. This is the nature of faith in life. Because God is interested, keenly interested in us seeing him for who he is. Worshiping him for who he is. Not what we perceive as the benefits and the blessings and the perks of it. So Ahaz and his people are in a season of great distress. And will they trust him? Consider how eager God is for them to trust him. God tells them that it's not going to work. Verse 7, it won't stand, won't come to pass. Come on, the head of Syria is only Damascus, and the head of Damascus is some king named Rezin. And within 65 years anyway, and so this would come to bear out in history, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. 65 years in the future, the Assyrian king, Esarhaddon is his name, this is known in history, repopulated the former northern tribe. So that the tribe, the northern tribes, Israel, though they got carried away into exile, they had no homeland to go to because their homeland got repopulated. They weren't a people anymore. Ephraim is going to be shattered from being a people. Come on, who is the head of Ephraim? Samaria. The head of Samaria. This is cool poetry. Doesn't even mention his name. The only time the name of the king of Israel is mentioned is one time at the beginning. After that, he's referred to as the son of Remaliah. Do any of you know anything about Remaliah? Uh Uh-uh, me neither. That's kind of the point. The head of this country is just this little itty-bitty king. Your head, your father, your provider, your protector is Yahweh. Come on. So he tells him the truth. He tells him what's going to be. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. God is so eager to demonstrate his faithfulness When Ahaz is afraid, he tells him, you don't have to be afraid. I will take care of it. And then he reminds him, he speaks the truth to him. If you're not going to stand firm in faith, you're not going to stand at all. This is true of us, for us as Christians. If we're not going to trust God in the little things, the lesser evils, the smaller enemies, the Israel's and the Syria's of life, then how will we ever trust him with the bigger enemies, the us series of life? How will we ultimately trust him with the greatest enemies, sin and death in the world? Right, our official position is, yes, of course we trust Christ for our salvation. Yes, he rose from the dead after all. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But if we don't trust him in the lesser things, if we don't trust him in our marriages, in our parenting, in our work life, in our finances, with our relationships, what makes you so sure you actually are standing on faith in him against your greatest enemies? Right? Do you follow the logic? If you don't trust God with the little enemies, if you just say, ah, I'll handle those ones by myself, aren't you much more likely with the bigger enemies to respond in the same way? In Isaiah, all over the book of Isaiah, 
is the gospel, the good news of God's mercy and provision for sinners. It's just in different words. And this event in the history of Israel is a little microcosm of the gospel. God tells Ahaz what is going to happen. And then he warns him, you have to trust me. God is faithful whether we see it or not. Like that's just a statement of fact. God is faithful. We will only see his faithfulness as faithfulness through the eyes of faith. By seeing evidence of his presence, his provision, his protection, his goodness. So he tells Ahaz the way it is and what he needs to do. Verse 10, he goes even further. Again, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of me. Yahweh, personal name, all caps for Lord, his personal name. You can trust me, ask a sign. As low as the grave, as high as the sky, ask for a sign. Now, if you really wanted to trust God, and God came to you offering a sign. Your marriage is on the rocks. You know that it's right to stay and to work it out. And you're committed to doing that. And you're asking God for help. And God says to you, I'm going to help you. Ask me for a sign. What are you going to say? Yes, please. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Yes. Any sign? Yes, you can have a sign. What are you going to ask for? You're probably going to ask for something little because like, we don't have enough faith to ask for big signs. But if you really want to trust him, when someone offers you evidence of their faithfulness, you say, yes, thank you. Ahaz, dirtbag, sounds pious. What does he say? I will not put Yahweh to the test. That sound, that almost sounded like faith, except for it's not at all. God can see right through his pious language, his facade of trusting in God. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God? See how now Isaiah goes from your God to my God. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, Ahaz, this is for us to reckon with. Ahaz has never trusted God. He's never trusted God in the little things. So much so, he doesn't want to trust God. He doesn't want to see him. He doesn't want to see evidence of his faithfulness. He doesn't want to rely on God, right? Because faith can be kind of a challenge, can it not? Many of you have struggled by faith to hold on to faith, and sometimes the Lord says, keep waiting, or sometimes the Lord doesn't do the thing that you want him to do, and almost never in your timing, and rarely in your way. It can be difficult to have faith. It requires you to be vulnerable, to actually entrust yourself to God. Ahaz isn't willing, and he's never been. I'm going to read you one snippet from 2 Kings that make this abundantly clear. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. He's 20 years old when it happened. He did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Ahaz sent messengers down into verse 7 of 2 Kings to the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. What? Excuse me? I willingly take up servitude to the foreign empire, though God has given me promises for this people in this throne, I willingly get off of the throne. And in fact, I will pay you to come and rescue me. Ahaz 
has never been a man of faith. And when God offers him a sign, he refuses because he doesn't want anything to do with God. Now, here's something really interesting. It's wonderful when you study the Bible and you get to see the character of God played out in the events that Scripture records. What did Ahaz say when he was offered a sign? I will not put Yahweh to the test. That comes from earlier in Israel's history, in the time of the Exodus, when the people did exactly that. Here's a picture of the gospel and salvation. In the Exodus, Israel is in slavery to Egypt. If you're a Christian, you have previously been enslaved to sin. You are brought out by the hand of God. Now, Israel, they're wandering in the desert. What more evidence do they need of God's faithfulness? They've been delivered from slavery in Egypt. They get backed up against the Red Sea. They panic, and God parts the Red Sea. They walk through on dry ground. God accompanies them with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Christian, do you need more evidence of God's presence in your life? Israel finds themselves in the desert in I mean, if you went for a long walk in the desert on a sunny day, what would happen to you? Audience participation time. What would happen to you if you walked in the desert on a hot day for a long time? You'd get thirsty, really grumpy. I mean, I would love to know what percentage of us right now in this room, though the church service is like an hour and 10 minutes, brought a water bottle because we might get dehydrated. We take water bottles everywhere now. I mean, I'm old. Let me sound old for a minute. When I was a kid... We didn't take water bottles anywhere. Now you can't go to church without your water bottle. So these poor Israelites, before water bottles were invented, they're in the desert and they grumble against Moses and against God. Everybody get your water bottle. Now I've reminded you to take a sip, have a sip. They grumble against Moses and they say, what did you lead us out here to do? To kill us and our children and our animals by thirst? Christian, We have been delivered by slavery to sin and to death for all eternity. God reminds us of his faithfulness and his provision. He's given us the church. He's given us his word. He's given us the spirit in us. And there are times, by God's design, he leads us into a wilderness to prove to us again his faithfulness, except for very often we just try to fix it ourselves. So you have a financial problem. Money is tight. Have you spent significant time? Let's just call significant time a half hour a day for a week. I mean, we're using the term significant really loosely here. Have you spent even that much time before the Lord saying, Lord, will you help me? Lord, will you help me see you clearly? Lord, will you help me trust you? Lord, will you help me hear your voice? Or did you just do one of these? God, please help me. And immediately you jumped on Facebook Marketplace to find something that you could sell. You're having trouble at work. You don't really enjoy your job. Have you spent time asking the Lord what would he desire for you? What he wants to help you see about yourself, about others, about the circumstances? Or did you just jump online while you're getting paid at your other job? Did you jump onto Indeed? Did you jump onto a website to find a new job, right? This is how easy it is that though we know our official position is God is faithful, God is with us in the particulars of our life, is it not the case that we so readily immediately try to save ourselves? work on our own plan, come up with our own way, our own strategy. Because spending extended time seeking the Lord is just so impractical. It doesn't maximize your short-term benefit. Are you trusting God? So they grumble against God and they test him. Let me read this to you from Exodus. This is what God says. Behold, I will stand before you there, he says to Moses, on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and, the, and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. 
And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested Yahweh by saying, is Yahweh among us or not? So Ahaz, I will not put Yahweh to the test because I don't care if he is here or not. I don't want to see if he is here or not. I'm not willing to entrust myself to him. I'm not willing to do what he says because God has a long history of having people do some crazy stuff so that he gets all the credit. And I'm not wanting to do all that. I want my plan, my fix, my way. I know how to get out of debt. I need to get a second job. I need to start selling some stuff. I need to spend no extra money. I know how to find a new job. I just got a network. I know how to fix my marriage. I know how to get my kids out of rebellion. I know how to weather cancer. And we end up living sometimes as though Jesus isn't alive, as though the Spirit isn't in us, scrambling to come up with our own plan when we don't have to. Ahaz absolutely refuses. And then in the rest of the passage, God tells them about the consequences that will come. And history bears it out. Three years after this event, Syria is conquered by the Assyrians. Another 10 years after that, Israel is conquered by the Assyrians. And then in the son of Ahaz, in Hezekiah's lifetime, Assyria comes and ransacks much of Judah. But the prophecy that bears relevance for us is immediate and apparent because of what we know of Christ. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The you is plural. I think there, I don't understand exactly how all of this works. Isaiah can be really um, challenging for me to understand all of. I think Isaiah mixes together prophecy in the present for Ahaz and the people with prophecy for all of God's people that plays out into the future. Chapter 6 through chapter 12, they all go together. I would encourage you, read them in one sitting. It won't take you very long. They all go together. We learn more about Emmanuel in the other chapters that make it really difficult to believe that all got fulfilled in the time of Isaiah. So When Isaiah says, I will give you a sign, it's now plural. It's for all of the people of God. And that sign is that God will prove his faithfulness. He himself will come again. This is Jesus, Matthew says in the New Testament. As Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David... Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Are you trusting God in the particular circumstances of your life? He wants to prove his faithfulness to you. Will you see the evidences of his presence? Will you look for them? When you are looking to be faithful to God, when you are looking for the evidences of his presence, you see the evidences, the signs. You see them everywhere. You see them in the warmth of the sun on a spring day. You see them in the people of God. You see them in Scripture. You see them in the testimony of your own conscience 
You see them in God's track record of faithfulness. You see them everywhere if you want to see them. If you really want to trust God, you see evidences of his faithfulness, and then you wait for him. And you do what he instructs you to do, and he will again prove his faithfulness. But it will require you to entrust yourself to him, to be vulnerable before him, to feel a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit uncertain. We live in a culture where you're expected to have a plan for everything, a plan for everything, and a timeline, and a budget. And God doesn't often work that way. You can trust him in your marriage, in your work, in your finances, in the defects of your character, in your aspirations. We can trust him because he is always with us by the spirit that he has given. We're going to remember the death and the resurrection of Christ on our behalf and take communion together this morning. So as the ushers come and prepare to serve us,